Hello, all my YouTube friends. <laughs> Welcome to Red Tool House in the winter wonderland that we are. At the time of this recording, most of the country is nestled in a nice layer of snow and ice. So for those of you partaking in that, you have my sympathies. Those of you in Florida, you know where you can stick it. You may hear the sound of our generator in the background. We're going on day five with no power, but uh, no big deal. We will survive. So in today's video, I want to talk about a contentious topic that I kind of dug up accidentally in the video I did a couple weeks ago. Y'all just blowed me up, as we'd say up Elk River, with a lot of comments about sawmill lumber. So the question in today's video is, can you legally build your structure, your house, with sawmill lumber? And the answer to that is yes and no. <laughs> How's that for waffling? So let's get into it. Well, I think the easiest way to address this topic is let's just start with an example. House is up here on our 100 acres, and let's say I decided I convinced my wife to sell the house in the front part of the property, go to the very back of the property, and build a nice cabin with lumber off the property with a sawmill, and that becomes our new secluded living after the boys have moved out. Hmm. Very tempting, no? So could we do that legally and build the entire house with lumber I milled off the property. So first let's talk about why is there even an issue of legality when it comes to building something yourself with lumber and material you've acquired yourself. Well, it comes back to our illustrious government. And you really need to start with building codes at the national level down to the state level, the county level, and even municipality level if you live in such one. So you have to look at those codes because they want to save you from yourself, correct? Most of those building codes, if not all of them, are going to talk about inspected or stamped structural wood and how it's a requirement that you, you use that when building a structure. So I can't preface enough. Everything else I'm going to talk about in this video, I have to preface. Start there. States, counties, and municipalities are all going to have different interpretations, different enforcements, all of that. So start there. Do not take what I'm giving you and say, oh, I don't have to worry about any of those laws. But let's get into the nitty gritty here. So to make sure we're all on the same page, let's address what I'm talking about when I say inspected or stamped wood. I have here in front of me on my mill this lovely new 2x6 that I acquired at Home Depot. It actually costs more than my first semester of college tuition. But if we zoom in real quick, we can see there is indeed a stamp. That was not as legible. But you can see this stamp has a marking of the company that inspected it, has the mill that it came from, its grade, and some other information there. So that is required to be on any structural lumber that you use to build. And I'm, I'm using vague terms there because, again, there's variation depending on your state, county, blah, blah, blah. So because that's been inspected, that is now safe to use in building a structure because it has met certain specifications, certain standards, certain moisture content. Uh, there's just all these assumptions that are now made about this board because it passed inspection that it can do what it was made to do and that's be a part of holding up a wall or, or whatever you're using it for so the one thing you'll find in most building codes again check your own is the word structural that structural wood has to have an inspection stamp on it so with that being said if you look at structural, structural is load-bearing, you know, stuff that actually holds up portions of the house, the walls, the, the trusses, the roofs, the rafters, whatever you're doing there. But there's so much in the house that isn't structural that you have some options. So think about your sheathing, your flooring, your subflooring, your siding, your trim work, uh, finished flooring, any of, that, any of that finished carpentry does not have to be inspected and it can obviously come from your mill. So if you looked at it from that example, so well, what if I just built, using my example building a cabin, what if I just went out and bought all the sticks to build the structural skeleton of my cabin and then milled everything else? Sure, absolutely, that would be great. And you could really save a lot of money there, uh, out of pocket money, now your time and, and uh, expenses with the mill would be factored in, but you could really save a lot of out of pocket money and build a cabin exactly the way you wanted to with your own specifications and still comply with inspection laws. 
Now, code language also uses the term dwelling. Uh, and some you'll see will have exemptions for ag structures or they'll specify residency. So it's one of those things to say, well, am I building an actual residency or am I just building a building? For example, my barn uh, here in West Virginia, that barn would classify as an agricultural structure and would not need to be inspected. You know, my pig farrowing barn, my um, boar corral in the back, uh, my brooder coop here that you see over my shoulder, all of those things are ag buildings and there would be no compliance issues at all with that. So it may beg the question, well, what if you built a really nice barn, I mean a really nice barn, and you just happened to sleep in it at night because you wanted to keep track of your animals? <laughs> well, that's between you and the code inspector. <laughs> I'm not recommending that one way or the other, but there could be some, some ways to try to navigate that. So in doing the research for this video, the $20,000 question that I ran into, or the $20,000 issue, is enforcement. There's the code that's on the books, and then there's the code that's actually enforced by the inspector at the county level or municipality level. Again, in my state of West Virginia, that all uh, rides on the county level. We're in a very rural county. I have no municipality that I have to answer to, and uh, really the county government is extremely, extremely small. They like the permit dollars, but they don't like the permit labor that goes into enforcing that. So when I built a house 20 years ago, permit fees were paid, but I never saw an inspector in the entire time I built that house. It took me two years to build it because I was doing it all myself and never had an inspector show up. In fact, I brought inspectors in just to make sure I was doing stuff right because the county wasn't going to show up ever. Crazy stuff, I know. So you could say, to heck with it, I'm throwing the building codes out the window. I'm building whatever I want to because this is America dag on it and this is how we do things. You have that option, but just know there could be consequences. So in all my research, here's the part that I found the most exciting and intriguing. What about taking my own wood here and having it inspected so it could get stamped and be used for anything and be totally compliant with code? That is an option. There are companies that will do that. They will come inspect the wood. Now, before you say, well, sure, if you've got a million dollars laying around or you're flush with cash, any dummy could do that. But let me talk to you about that. The visuals would be much more compelling if they weren't covered in snow. <laughs> well, I want to I want to give a shout out to Timber Products in Georgia. I had a great conversation with them the other day and doing research for this video. And uh, I ended up talking with Katie Weaver first and foremost about this idea of what would it cost and what's the implications of having their company inspect a stack of lumber for me so I could use it and, and be completely compliant with building codes. I had such a good conversation with Katie that she later put me on the line with the vice president of the company, David, who spent more time than I would think a vice president should talking with me, but you can tell he loves what he does and uh, we, we had a great conversation, really neat talking to him. So I've got some great stuff. I hope you guys are sticking around for this because I've got some great stuff to go over and I have my notes here to help. So 20 years ago, I built this building, the building that's got the siding on it, not the pole barn structure. That's a 24 by 32 concrete pad, uh, single floor plan or open floor plan structure that, that Kelly and I lived in for two years when we first bought the property. Now I'm pretty certain it's been 20 years, so Bear with me on that, but I'm pretty certain I spent $26,000 total out of pocket to get that thing under roof and live in it. I believe my lumber costs were between ten dollars to $12,000 out of that twenty-six. So what if I told you in recreating that project, I could have all the lumber that I've milled to be able to rebuild this building inspected for less than 10% the, the cost of the sticks to buy in the first place. That example starts to make that very intriguing and very affordable. Now, Timber Products is one of several companies across the United States that offers that service. So I'm not gonna uh, quote their specific numbers because it's gonna be different where you are depending on which inspection area makes the most sense. <clears throat> In fact, David was so helpful, he gave me a reference to a website that is the ALSC.org. I think that's American Lumber Standard something with a C, dot org, um, that you guys can check out. I'll put a link below. But it actually shows all the different companies that do inspection 
Uh, these are even guys that are inspecting for like Home Depot, you know, Lowe's, those type of things, the huge mills. And they'll even show you pictures of their stamps. So when you go to the box store and you buy a 2x4, you're like, huh, I recognize that stamp. It's the same one on the website. So he, he wanted to point that out and give a shout out to his, uh, to his fellow inspectors that there's multiple options across the country that make more sense depending on your geographic location. So the way this works, as far as cost goes, most of these companies use an hourly rate. So they charge an hourly rate for the inspection time and travel time. So for the inspector to get to your location to do the inspection. Now, David informed me that they've got inspectors all over the country. So depending on where you are geographically and where the inspector is, that may be a considerable expense or it may not. You could, you could have an inspector in your backyard and not know it. So the inspection process basically consists of a grading, a visual inspection to grade the lumber, and then a moisture analysis. And it was really neat. David told me that a good inspector can, in, can grade and inspect a board as fast as he can flip it. And he's actually testing moisture then too because a trained inspector's hand knows, okay, that's most likely more than 19%. That's most likely less than 19%. So it's neat to think, okay, hourly rate wise, if you've got this guy set up where he can just keep flipping, flipping boards over, then it's not gonna take nearly as long as you might think. So along that same lines, Dave shared a great story about being prepared if indeed you're going to pull the trigger on this. Since you're being charged by the hour, the more you can be front loaded and be prepared at the front, the more you're going to save. So he gave an example of, Spectre shows up at a guy's place and he's like, oh yeah, I gotta get the tractor fired up so we can get the wood out, but the battery's dead. And it, so yeah, this guy's paying this hourly rate to have the inspector stand around and watch him work on his tractor. So, if you if you want to do this, use your use common sense and be ready. Uh, Dave suggests a you know, have your equipment warmed up and ready to go if you're going to use equipment. B have your wood already sorted because they are going to inspect it based upon width. So if you've got your stack of two by fours, you got your stack of two by sixes, two by eights, two by tens, have that already sorted. Also, avoid setups like these where you've got your wood stacked with your your rick boards or your sticker boards and the inspector has to work through all those sticker boards and flip and do those type of things, that can slow him down. Uh, David suggested have your wood stacked clean, no stickers in it, and sorted by size, and, and be ready to have the guy flip it somewhere. So if you've got it on the forks of, a, of your tractor, and uh, he can flip that off onto a trailer, or from a trailer off onto the ground, or, or whatever the case may be, one spot on the ground to the other, and plan on being there to assist. The more you can help this guy access this wood, the less it's gonna cost you in the long run. So you can be his lackey, you can be, you can be handling wood and get it ready for him as he's going through and inspecting to save money. So you may be asking, is this inspection just as good as what you get from the box stores? Yes, because it, it's the same guys. So these companies, you know, these handful of companies across the country that are doing this are the same ones, the same inspectors that are at these large mills doing that type of inspection. So it may not be the exact same guy, but it's the exact same process, the exact same training, the exact same expertise. So your wood, once it's inspected, is just as good as the Lowe's wood or the Home Depot wood. Probably gonna be better if you milled it yourself. So what they do, Dave, tell me what they do when it's time to actually sign off on the wood. So you've got your stack of wood that's been uh, you know, grade two or higher. So it's good stuff that you can build with. They do a hammer brand. So literally bang, 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 going around with a hammer, putting that mark, that inspection stamp on that wood. So that wood is visually marked or they also have a crayon mark that they can do as well. So not only do you get the board stamped or marked, but you also get a full report that sticks with the wood. And that's important for this idea that David threw out that just blew my mind. So Dave suggested an idea that I thought was absolutely brilliant, dare I say evil genius level, except I really don't condone the actions of evil geniuses. But he suggested, okay, let's say you've got a project that requires 5,000 board feet of structural lumber. Well, if you've got the resources, why not mill 7,500 or 10,000 board feet of lumber, pay to have the inspector come in, Get your ducks in a row so you're ready to maximize your or minimize your time to maximize your savings build your project and then sell the other board feet of lumber that you had inspected for a premium because now it's as good if not better than box store wood and will comply with any inspection request when he told me that i was like okay mind blown here because many of us have a lot of resources at our disposal we have a lot of standing timber and a project may require X, 
but we can easily create x times 2 if just given enough time. So if I was trying to determine whether or not the inspection costs were really going to save me money on a 5,000 board foot project, in our example, but then realized, wow, if I could turn around and sell another 5,000 board feet at a premium, then maybe I, don't, I not only pay for my inspection costs, but I really eat into a lot of the out-of-pocket expenses or maybe even put some cash back in my pocket for this project. That's incredible. And the reason why this works is the inspection report stays with the wood. It doesn't stay with me, the miller, or the guy that created the wood. So when 5,000 board feet leave my property, if they've been inspected, hey, copy the report goes with it. So that's how that would pass inspection and still comply. So when you think about the fact that it's grade and moisture content of 19%, then you don't even need a kiln in that situation. You just need time. So if you can air dry your lumber, I can get 19% here pretty quickly in West Virginia, especially if I have it in the barn or have it under cover. So I don't even have to have the huge expense of a kiln. It's just the expense of obviously having the inspection done. But if I really wanted to take that on, it could become very viable very quick. So to answer the big question, can you build legally with sawmilled lumber? The answer is yes. You have to comply with your building codes and most likely have to have an inspection. But an inspection could be much more cost effective than you think. And you may actually be able to turn it into some additional revenue. Well, I hope you guys found this useful. What I'd like you to do is comment below if this is something you've run into before or you had no idea or your mind's blown like mine is and uh, just share. Let's get some additional comments going and maybe we'll even do a third follow-up video based on how you guys respond to this. All right, I hope everybody stays safe and stays warm. Again, you people in Florida, you know what you're dealing with. Just, just talk to me back in July and August when it's 900 degrees. All right, take care everybody.